Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Shakespeare. We continue examining uh, Othello. We finished uh, Acts 1, 2, and 3. Today, we start Act 4, uh, scene 1. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know what I usually, you know, when Hamlet says, how thinking what is beyond the grave should make us all pause. Because, you know, death being the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. With Hamlet, you usually come with questions. You very, like, you want to know more. You want to, to listen more. And there's this one critic who says, I've taught Shakespeare Hamlet for 50 years. And every time I teach it, I pay attention to, I notice new things. Every time somebody talks, there is valid issues, valid points. So this is the nature of, of Hamlet. And that's one reason why it's mind blowing, why it's a masterpiece, why it's the greatest literary work ever written. Uh, but with Othello, I usually come to the play with a heavy heart. Sometimes, uh, you know, Joey, what Joey did <laughs> at the end of, uh, the, 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 the novel he was reading when he realized that the main character that he fell in love with and identified with is possibly going to, uh, to die, he, he literally froze the novel, the character, by putting it in the, uh, in the freezer. That's very, by the way, you'll, inshallah, you'll do MA here and there and PhDs. You'll be surprised, especially if you go to the United States and the UK, to see how these pulp uh, cultures and these issues can be taken as examples to make points. So there is Joey, being Joey, makes a very profound point here. Sometimes we want to stop. Sometimes you want just to stop at page um, 10, 15, 100, and just imagine that this is not going to go, this is not going to be the, the, the tragedy it is. And there is one, if you are interested in reading, I'm sorry, I have to say this, I have to spoil it for you a, a little bit. There's a novel by uh, a fascinating young Indian uh, novelist whose name I keep forgetting. I'm sorry, I'm horrible, horrible at names. Uh, I'll get the name. Uh, the, the, the novel is called White Tiger. And uh, the name of the author is uploading. It tells the story of a young man like you, like me, if you consider me to be a young man. Uh, for the first probably 50 pages of the novel, the uh, the author is, come on, the author is, is it, are you sure, Aravinda Diga? Oh no, I don't think, I don't think this is, anyway, why is the name suddenly very strange to me? Anyway, so first 50 pages, this is a typical young person starting life with all the struggles and all the pain and all the suffering, all the sacrifices and the families and the kids and the, the mother and the father and the cousins and the siblings and the, the, the political issues and social issues and religious issues and the complications, the psychologies and the traumas and everything. It's like, I'm like, oh my God, this is me. You see a lot of yourself in this. And you identify, like the way we did with Hamid, you identify, you become this person and this person becomes you. He morphs into you, or you morph into this character. And then somewhere around page 50, he says, okay, I killed my boss and I stole $2 million, or a million dollars. So at one point, you don't want to continue reading the, the text. You want to stop. You want to, free, uh, to, to freeze it. You just want to run away because you have become a murderer suddenly you realize you identified with the wrong person. Like sometimes we realize, we see how, how, uh, how some of our best friends can turn into arch enemies, into 
our worst, most hated enemies. Now, it is with, heavy, with a heavy heart that I usually uh, go uh, watch uh, Othello, read Othello, study Othello, and think about Othello. I, sometimes I just want to stop there and imagine this ending in a different way. But again, we, have, we don't have the luxury of doing this because we have to do what we have to do. We have to study uh, the play eventually. And I want you to think about how you relate to Othello. I raised several questions and I'll continue raising questions. Now in act, uh, look at this uh, fascinating image. It's, it's in your book. Look at the facial expressions, look at the, the stage. You don't see the stage, but how everybody's positioned. And look at how Iago is exactly on his left shoulder with the, you know, the traditional image of uh, the angels, the, an the white angel being on your uh, right shoulder. And I'm not sure if the image is going to be, um, you know, shifted in, in the recording, but yeah, this is the right shoulder and this is the left shoulder. He's like Satan, he is whispering, whispering, insinuating and tempting him, dismissing him, causing, you know, the great fall. There is this Adam and Eve archetypal issue here. Look at the facial expressions. Look at the, the confidence in Iago. Look at the how destroyed. You can see it in his uh, in his eyes, Othello. Heartbreaking. There is anger, yes, but there's pain. There is hate here, but there's confidence. Remember we said how Iago was insinuating, alluding, suggesting, asking questions. There's no longer this. He's too open, too blunt. He's literally now giving Othello orders what to do and what not to do. And sheepishly, submissively, Othello listens and, and obeys. So in act uh, four, Othello has fallen completely into Iago's trap, moving deeper and deeper into, uh, into, in, into jealousy and rage. The play heads towards the climax in act uh, five. And again, I keep insisting on this. At, one, at any time, at any point, this could be reversed. The whole thing could turn into, uh, into a comedy. Uh, somebody could expose uh, Iago for the villain he is. But again, there's no hope for that. Hope is diminishing here. Uh, Iago unfolds more and more of his plot, again dragging Othello deeper into madness. Notice how Iago's strategies change from suggesting, raising questions, uh, alluding again to things, by allusion and innuendos, and how he become uh, so open, so blunt in the way he gives orders to. Uh, um, okay. Nice. Uh, in the opening scene, uh, again, we have uh, Othello and Iago on the stage that uh, mid conversation and Iago keeps reminding him, maybe she just kissed him. Maybe, I don't know, he keeps bringing things. And then he brings again the handkerchief. He wants to make sure that Othello never forgets. And he says, by heaven, I would most gladly have forgot it. I almost forgot it, Iago. Why do you keep bringing this to me? Thou saidst, oh, it comes all my memory as doth the raven or the infected house. You know, this the, in, in movies, we usually say the raven, it's like a sign of, of, bad, of, of a bad omen, infected house, a house that has evil. So this, is, this comes into my memory, beautiful image here, as doth a simile. 
uh, as does the raven or the infected house, boding to all, boding like bringing evil. He had my handkerchief. And the handkerchief is nothing, it's trivial. But what it stands for, the history, the narrative, the trust, the confidence, the fidelity. And probably the most heartbreaking scene in, in Shakespeare, one of the most ever. Had he said anything, tell me. What happened? What did he tell you? He had, my lord. But be you well assured, no more than he will answer. What have he said? Faith that he did, I know not what he said. Like, you know, pretending. What? What? Lie? And then that's just word, lie. Could be telling, not, not telling the truth, sitting with, sleeping with. And Iago is very conscious about how he uses words with so many meanings. Iago is in a way, he's a Shakespeare. He owns his words. He meticulously calculates his words and measures them. He knows that each word, each sound is going to have a particular impact. And then Othello, again, completing the sentence, with hair, and Iago, with hair, on hair, what you will, with the key, in the heart. You choose. But, you know, it's like giving him the fallacy of choice. Lie with hair. Hair, lie on hair, we say lie on hair. When they belie hair, lie with hair, sounds that's fulsome, handkerchief, confessions, handkerchief to confess. And be hanged for his labor, first to be hanged and then to confess. I tremble at this. Nature would not invest herself in, in such shadowing passion without some instruction. It is not words that shakes me thus. Pish. Noses, ears, and lips. Is it possible? Confess, handkerchief. Oh, devil. Look at the language. Fragments. No eloquency, uh, no, no his poeticality, no story to tell. He keeps repeating himself. He's totally devastated, he's totally gone, totally lost. Look at the prose. There's no longer poetic here, there's no poetry here. And he falls into a, a trance. He faints, falls down in a seizure. And again, a scene that would break any person, any person, any person's heart, any heart of a person who has a shred of decency, a shred of humanity. I understand why people would say Iago is pure evil, but I don't think he is pure evil that he's the devil himself, because again, that would, uh, 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 what's the word, uh, that would excuse him a little bit, justify him. But Othello, the, the, the general, the commander, the fighter, falls in a trance. He faints in a fit of rage, of jealousy, of agony, of pain, loss. We'll see what the, that man says. Now, look at this interesting, again, development of Iago's language and speech. He purposefully uses the word lie, which creates confusion, it has so many meanings, it creates ambiguity, because lie could be lie on, lie to, not telling the truth, or to sleep with. But again, he gives Othello the fallacy of freedom. You choose whatever you like. The audacity of Iago's suggestion is not lost on Othello, who, much like Cassio in Act II, becomes enraged and loses control. By the end of the line, Othello is speaking in nonsensical phrases, fragments, incomplete repetitive sentences. The man, once possessed by supreme eloquence, has been reduced to a stammering fool, a stuttering fool. The devilish Iago, always playing the role of the saint in public, tries to soothe Othello a little bit later on here sometime. Uh, the irony, of course, is not lost on, on us. Uh, the man is morally bankrupt. He preached some uh, doctrine. However, he is not lost 
uh, uh, he preaches. Uh, 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 sometimes he calms him down. Don't be jealous, tells our fellow. But we know uh, more than anybody else that this is the greatest of all ironies. Honest Iago. Iago tries to defend his demona later on in the scene. I'll, I'll show you in, in, in a bit. Maybe it's just a slip. It is a slip. It's a mistake. She doesn't mean it. It's not that she's unfaithful to you. As much as we dislike Iago, and you could consider him pure evil, it's up to you. We could respect, some people would respect his cunning, his, his perfect planning. He's skilled in rhetoric, seemingly building again his case with uh, uh, very logically knowing what to say and when to say and how to say uh, stuff by introducing the lying bid scenario here, then the handkerchief, then the double meaning of, of, of the word lie. And so on the case is framed more as from the defense than from the prosecution, not easy, uh, not an easy feat for for a fellow. Poor, poor, poor fellow. But Huck, is so loud. Diego, oh, work on my medicine, work. My magic, my evil is working. Thus, credulous fools are caught. Ah. A fool. Look at this, he's the man could be dying. The man is triumphant. Enter again, uh, Cassio, and in the plan here, he tells him, look at the lies here, tells Iago, oh, well, what's the matter, Cassio is worried. Uh, my lord is falling into an uh, epilepsy. Uh, this is his second fit. He had one yesterday. We, we, it could have happened in between the, the, the scenes and the acts, but, you know, so don't worry, don't worry, just... Now, uh, the plan here, again, uh, Othello wakes up, Oyago tells him, okay, listen, uh, go hide somewhere. It's like what happened in, in Hamlet in a, in a way. Go hide somewhere and I'll again make you listen to the confessions. Now, some, some, somebody might have said like, why, like when, when Bianca came on stage last act, like why bring Bianca? What purpose is she going to do? She has a purpose. With Shakespeare, everybody, everything has a purpose. So he, he talks about uh, Bianca, Iago, and makes Cassie talk about Bianca with Othello hiding somewhere, thinking that they are talking about, about this demonic. So he, like cunningly, in the same uh, like, uh, dialogue, fly uh, this demon well, and you are, should, and I, I'm sure if this is, again, acting on stage, he, he would be saying the word, this demona in a loud voice, so Othello hears that, that yeah, this is this demona. And then now, if this would be in Bianca's power, and lower his voice when he says Bianca, how quick, quickly should you? Alas, poor caitiff, look how he loved. And again, these are because uh, Cassius cannot, doesn't know that yeah, Othello is hiding, we know, so we hear him. We hear, and then Othello says, look how he laughs. So it's not that she's cheating on him, but somebody lower than him, tricking him. The man she's cheating on him with is treating her like, like trash, like a prostitute. He's just laughing. He even doesn't, when, he, when Iago says, would you marry her? He says, me marry her? Oh, no, like, you know, dismissing this. I never knew a woman uh, love a man so much, Iago. Casio, I marry her? Oh, my customer, please bear some charity to my, to my wit here, Zalama, yeah. bear some charity to my wit, why would I marry Bianca? Don't think it so unwholesome. Ha, 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 ha. So, 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 they laugh that when faith, the faith, the cry goes that you shall marry her. Prithee, say true, yeah, Rajil. I am a very villain else. Have you scored me uh, well? And it continues here, the talk about uh, uh, this Demona, about Bianca, Othello thinking this is this Demona, crying, oh dear Cassio, as it were, his gesture imports it. Cassio again laughs even more. And now at this very moment, we don't know, we don't see what's his name, Iago controlling Bianca. But everything is going against Othello. Everything, fate, destiny, everybody. Even this demona's innocence and purity is working against him. So Bianca, 
uh, it could have been Othello, uh, Iago's plan, comes on the stage and gives back the handkerchief while, again, remember, somebody is listening, spying, and watching Othello. Throws back to him, he said, you found this, you said you found it, you're lying, you didn't find it. And again, look at this, Bianca is the most powerful woman in this place. She's low class, she's a prostitute, uh, but she respects herself. She uh, doesn't uh, just uh, obey women blindly. She's fighting back, she's fighting for herself here. She has probably more honor, more strength than other high class women. We'll talk about this in a bit. I quoted from your uh, book if you want to go back to that. So let the devil and his dam haunt you. What did you mean by that same handkerchief you gave me even now? I was a fine fool to take it. I must take out the whole work, a likely piece of work that you should find it in your chamber and know not who left it there. This is some uh, minx's token. A woman gave it to you. And I must take out the work there. She returns it back. It's fighting, standing up to men, to patriar patriar patriarchy. There, give it your hobby horse. Who, uh, wheresoever you had it, I'll take out no work. And she dumps him. She breaks up with him. How now, my sweet Bianca? How now? How, how now? By heaven, that should be my handkerchief. Othello commenting from behind whatever, wherever he's standing, that this is. Now, Bianca's outburst is notable because it helps draw again the, the, the distinction between uh, the, the, the high class, this demon and the middle class, perhaps uh, uh, Emilia and then the low, the low class. Bianca is the first woman in the story uh, who is willing to confront her partner, who uh, rejects him, who is not fully pleased with the situation. On the one hand, uh, to us, this reaction may seem positive, by the way, and modern trait, women being strong and independent, rejecting men, uh, in, in giving them, dictating on them what to do. At the, at the time of the play, however, this outburst could have further emphasized the stereotypes that lower class people are rude and tough and crude and less refined. Because again, they're inferior to the rich class, but still, Bianca would be seen as unruly rather than in, in, in independent. Regardless of how she is seen, Bianca provides a, a, a really, a, probably a second, a third perspective to the idea of womanhood in the play that Shakespeare uh, presents. She may be of a lower social station, but she has integrity and is willing to confront issues rather than dance around like what we uh, see uh, Desdemona do, what Emilia did when, her, when Iago, when she gave, probably took the uh, uh, handkerchief to Iago who snatched it and then later lied to her mistress about it to protect her husband. She's more direct and refuses to play as many games as others in the story, setting up a nice contrast and affecting quite positively on the average people. In Othello, the play, the social elite uh, by the way, pay attention to Othello the play, inverted commas or italics means the text. One of the questions in the, the, in the test that many of you fell for was a tricky question like this. Not sure which one was it, or whether it was one or two. Uh, it was like a, in Hamlet, uh, the soliloquy something, and it was that the only mistake in the statement was that Hamlet uh, was not between inverted commas. So it was referring to the character. If there are inverted commas, it refers to the text. No inverted commas refers to the character. So in Othello, the social elite are too caught up in protecting public images. They just more, more, are more interested in what people see, how people see them. We've seen this Demona's uh, father being very angry because what people are going to, to say about me, a black man marrying my, my daughter. The images that they make more trouble for themselves than if they were direct and spoke from, from the heart. We also see that Bianca, despite her second class social status, has a great concern for her honor and her reputation. It's not just the social elite who, ha who have a need to worry about such things, but so too do common uh, and low-class people. Although this may seem absurd to those of the higher social 
order because again, after all, she's a prostitute for Bianca and all the people like her issues of integrity are also very real and very significant. Her interest in such intangible concerns adds to her appeal as a strong independent woman despite her minor, her minor role. So Othello comes back with now all sorts of evidence, uh, the narrative evidence that the stories, the, uh, the, the suggestions, the implications, the innuendos, the handkerchief, the confessions. He's now, he now has a confession. But remember, you said this when I asked you before. He just, all he needs to do is ask Christimona, talk to her directly, frankly, openly. That's it. But again, if he does that, we will not have this play. Did you perceive how he laughed at his vice? Did, he, did, you see, did you see how he laughed? Oh, Iago. And did you see the handkerchief? Was that mine? Used by this hand. Wallahi, Simbi Amini it was used. And to see how he prizes the foolish woman, you, you, your wife. She gave it him and he has given it to this whore. He gave it to Bianca. So it means nothing. He's playing. You are... I would have him dine years a killing. This is a beautiful part here in this scene. Gharib, very strange. All of a sudden, all the hate and the anger against this demona. Othello says, a fine woman, a fair woman, a sweet woman. And there is no suggesting by Iago. He says, nay, nay. you must forget that. She's no longer a woman. She's no longer sweet, no longer fair, no longer fine. And look at, uh, there is a com commentary in your book how yeah, and it, uh, directly Othello changes. He stops. He changes 180 degrees. He suddenly changes. One moment, she's fine, fair, sweet. And then she's not. All because Iago told him. I let her rot and perish and be damned tonight. Uh, tonight, for she shall not live. She shall not live. And he talks about how he's going to kill her, hang her. And then he asks, poison her, or po to poison her. Iago, can you bring me poison? Here, look, get me some poison, Iago, this night. And Iago, again giving the orders, he's in command here, he's the general, he's the man, he's the powerful, he's the epicenter of this. Do it not with poison, strangle her in her bed. Remember a wife for a wife by Iago? This is like the, in the Bible, an eye for an eye. She cheated on you on a bed, and now kill her, strangle her, probably the most horrible of all types of killings. All killings are hard. If she stabbed her, or I don't know, but this it takes time because I've never killed anybody, but it takes time, I think, as I see in movies, how to smother somebody, to strangle somebody. And the pain, especially that you have to see them, to look them in the eye. Strangle her in her bed, even the bed she had contaminated. Cheated on you. And then Othello, good, good. Good, the justice of it pleases. Yes, an eye for an eye, a bed for a bed. Very good. Oh, the transformation, the sudden change, the dramatic Iago Boccaccio, let me be his undertaker. I will kill Cassio. And now, uh, uh, Ludovico, who was Desdemona's uncle, came from uh, Venice giving new, uh, give a, uh, a letter to Othello, please come back to, uh, to Venice, and saying that Cassius should stay here and be the commander in, uh, in Cyprus. And as expected, is Demona unwittingly, naively, unaware, is happy, expresses her happiness for Cassius. And she says, a most, uh, a most unhappy one, I would do much 
to atone them for the love I bear to Cassio, where later she expresses somewhere, fire and brine stone. My lord, are you wise, Desdemona? What, is he angry? Maybe the latter moved him, for as I think they do command him home, debuting Cassio in his government. Desdemona, by my troth, I'm glad on it. I'm happy, oh, finally, thank God Cassio is being treated justly. Indeed, my lord, Othello, I'm, I'm glad to see you mad. Desdemona, why, sweet Othello? And the devil, and he strikes her, he slaps her. This is called uh, the scene where he uh, uh, faints. It's called the trance scene, where he trance means he's in a trance in a fit. This is called the slap scene. Probably the most horrible of all scenes in Shakespeare, where a woman is physically attacked on the stage. I tried to look at other plays by Shakespeare to see whether, you know, there are men who kill women. We see them. And again, that's horrible. But this physical abuse of women is probably equally horrible. Basically, the only woman, if I, may, I could be mistaken, but the, if not the only, the main Shakespearean character that physically abuses a woman, attacks a woman, slaps a woman, is Othello, the Arab, the Moor, the Black, originally Muslim, North African, Middle Eastern man. Because white people don't do this. For a white man, we see Iago is going to kill his wife. But this strike scene, this slap scene, it's a horrible thing. The worst thing a man can do is abuse his wife or again. I want to say children, but sometimes, you know, children drive you crazy. But yeah, that's also bad. Why, sweet Othello, the devil, the shatana. And then the slap scene, heartbreaking. When Othello becomes so enraged by this Demona's innocent remarks that when she expresses happiness for uh, uh, Cassio, that he strikes her with his hand, his jealousy has become so overbearing that he has lost all sight of propriety, you know, propriety being proper, acting properly, and has crossed over an important line of decorum in literature, in life, in, in Europe, in everywhere, from which he may never return, he actually will never return. Now Ludovico is shocked beyond imagination, like, just two months ago, you were a sane person in command and a general, a sensible person. He's justifiably shocked here with what he has just witnessed, quickly and forcefully condemns Othello's action, contrasting his apparent lawlessness in Cyprus with the valiant and honorable way he presented himself. I remember in, in scene one, even uh, this Demona's husband, uh, sorry, father said, this is Venice when uh, Iago and Rodrigo were shouting beyond his balcony because he knows Venice is a place of law and order. Even when he went to the court and the court said, yes, your, your daughter wants him as a wife. So he obeyed, abided by uh, the, the, uh, the rule of law. So Venice is uh, where we have law and order, but Cyprus is lawless. It's a place of war. It's closer probably to the Ottoman Empire. So crazy. And this Demona, I haven't deserved this. Ludovico, my lord, this wouldn't be believed in Venice. Though I should swear, I saw it. They're not going to believe me because nobody does this. Nobody even imagines this. It's very much, look at how Shakespeare is emphasizing the difference, the gap, the chasm between this man who is originally an Arab and the others, the white European Christian. Make her amend. She weeps. She's crying. Oh, devil, devil. Now she's double devil, not one. If that the earth could teem with a woman's tears, each drop she falls would prove a crocodile. I'm not sure if this is the first expression of crocodile uh, tears, but these are all crocodiles. She's fake. She's false. Out of my sight. This demona, I will not stay to offend you. Look at how meek she is. Obedient. She's turning into 
another Gertrude, another Ophelia. I will not stay to offend you. She doesn't reply. She doesn't act. I haven't done, I haven't deserved this. Typically, an Elizabethan woman. Truly, and look at the stupid Ludovico. He praises her for this. Truly, an obedient lady. I do beseech your lordship. Call her back. He's not going to do so. As Ludovico attempts to extract an explanation from Othello, Othello slanders this demona as a whore then commands her to leave some of the worst things again. This is a disgusting scene on, on many levels. Upon her exit, Othello continues his tirade, attempting to regain some sense of composure, but again, he lost everything. He even lost our sympathy as audience. But failing, the De Vigo, the extension of orderly Venice cannot believe what he sees. That Othello would change so drastically in short in such a short time is beyond his comprehension why have you changed we would agree that such a change is drastic but it is also a testament to how quickly one's jealousy uh, jealousies may destroy him in addition othello's rapid decline also serves to heighten the tragic effect of this story and probably this is part of shakespeare's telling us that uh, these are I'm not sure if this is again, again, that stereotype of Arabs being extreme, either too good or too bad, too happy, too, etc. So he's now, he's too in love with his wife and now he, he hates her too much. Very tragic, very, very extreme, very radical. For one, so great to fall so far, so quickly, is even more tragic and unexpected than had his fall happened more uh, gradually. And the last uh, 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 two bits here, sorry, I took more time than I expected. Again, Ludovico, what? Strike his wife? He's now alone on, with Iago on the stage. Yes, anymore. Strike his wife? What? Is this his use? Is this his habit? Does he do this all the time? Or did the letters uh, work upon his blood? Allah, Iago, you know, we expect what he's going to say. Alas, alas, it's not honesty in me to speak. What I have seen and known, you shall observe yourself. You saw yourself. And his own courses will denote him so that I may save my speech, do but go after and mark how he continues. And the scene ends with the Vigo. I'm sorry that I am deceived in him. Exactly what we as audience, all the respect we keep for Othello, all the hope is now lost. We are deceived in him. We are disappointed uh, in him. Now, Finally, Iago's language suggests an air of flippancy about him. There is confidence now. He's in control, 100%. He's fully aware of, the, of his words' impact. He dismisses them. And he remember when he says, what, when he lie on her, lie with her, what you like, whatever you want, which is akin to saying whatever you want. Whereas Iago, upon this scene, has been pretty careful to play the emphatic friend, reluctantly giving details about the alleged affair here, in the previous scenes, he was reluctant and careful. Here, he abandons these pretensions. He's open, he's blunt, he's giving a commands. Don't kill her. He suggests how to kill her. Don't kill her by poisoning her or whatever. Strangle her in the bed where uh, that she contaminated. He knows that Othello has fallen hopelessly into his trap and he and is in his, in his arrogance over the approaching fall of Othello. Iago shamelessly begins to show his true colors. He knows, of course, that Othello is so absorbed in his agony and pain and suffering and jealousy. Iago, although central to the action, is becoming more and more a voice in the background, serving in some ways as Iago's alter ego, as the devil, a representation of his subconscious. I like this idea, probably I'll go back to it, how uh, gradually Iago becomes uh, the, the, the evil angel, the bad angel, the alter ego of Othello. Uh, I'll stop here and I'll read, please say things if you, if you have comments. Uh, anybody, if you want to comment anything before you go uh, to do it for you for a week. Hi, Jamal. 
any question? Fine. Uh, thank you very much. I'll stop here. And uh, see you Wednesday, inshallah. We continue uh, act for uh, scene, uh, scene two. And again, I leave this with uh, a broken heart, a heavy heart over uh, what has happened to, uh, to Othello. But again, that's again how the different experiences from Shakespeare. Each play has uh, different reactions. We can talk uh, later on. Assalamu alaikum.